Perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you, Klaus, for the introduction. Also, thank you to my colleague Jakub. He's here with me and who really is the brain behind this tool and who will probably help me if I get flustered during the Q&A. So I'm happy to talk to you about putting linguistic research data on a map, especially uh, in the next 10 minutes, which is going to be a tour de force. I'll briefly introduce the project and very, very briefly give you a use case. What does it mean to put data on a map? Um, I'm going to talk behind the technology behind it, which is an API, and I'll show you, so to say, two more elaborate use cases of this tool. Uh, the DUE project, Deutsch in Österreich, or German in Austria project, is a very large-scale research project in four universities, uh, in four institutions in Austria, and it basically investigates the variation, contact, change, and perception of all kinds of varieties of German. In Austria, uh, along, a different, uh, uh, along different research questions, different theoretical approaches, and with a variety of methods. For our purpose, very important is the data that is used and gathered by this research project. And here we're focusing on the language data, on language recordings. Uh, one, so to say, part of that is the traditional sociolinguistic interview, where we have approximately like 310 hours of that in our database. Um, conversation among friends, so two informants talk to each other without a researcher present. That's roughly 160 hours. We furthermore have computer-aided language production experiments, so our informants watch a stimulus on a computer and respond to that stimulus. This is roughly 270 hours. And then we have oral questionnaires. This is an older number. This is far more than 160 hours at this point. And all of this data is obviously also being analyzed. Uh, this is currently done with, or this is done with manual annotations. There's roughly 160,000 of them. And it would not be a large scale research project without some problems with the data. I've brought some of them. Um, the data is inconsistently tokenized. So some of this data is tokenized on a sentence level, uh, some on a word level. Um, there is an inconsistent transcription. We utilize orthographic transcription, transcription according to the GATT standard, phonetic transcription where need be, and sometimes no transcription at all. And because it is a, so to say, a long time project running for eight years now, the database has historically grown, so there is no single source of truth for the time alignment in the database. This is kind of due to the heterogeneous tokenization. So this is the data in the shortest possible way. I'm just going to show you what the Sprachatlas actually does. The use case, so to say, is, hey, I have linguistic data, i.e. language. I want to put it on a map and ideally listen to it. I'm just going to show you how that is done. This is what the tool looks like currently. And here you can see and hopefully hear me doing exactly that, putting a data point on the map here from a language production experiment, the word Betrachtung being read out loud in <laughs> different uh, oopsie, in different places. I don't think you can hear it. I'm sorry. OK, no. we'll see. I mean, I have some more examples. We'll see if the others work. So yeah, the basic way we're doing this, how we're bringing linguistic research data on a map is by utilizing an API. An API stands for an application programming interface. And we're shortening this by saying these are two computers talking to each other. So how does the workflow look? We have a lot of this data that is collected by our researchers, by our informants, and all of this is put into a database, in the DU database. There, it is enriched with metadata, especially relevant to the place where it was collected, because it's a variationist linguist project, so we're interested in dialects as well, and also information about the speakers, how old are they, um, what gender do they have, what, what jobs do they have, and so on. Then, ideally, it's transcribed by one of our researchers or assistants, and then it's analyzed. And so we uh, manually annotate the data. All of this is part of the database, and this is how the API communicates with each other. This is then, so to say, the API takes the data and puts it on the map. And of course, it would be very trivial to just put all of our data on the map. 
So we want to use specific hooks to actually filter the data. And so far, among them are obviously the place. I mean, it's a map. There's um, information about the informants we can use as filters. There's the transcription when it's available. And there's the annotation and much more. More concretely, how the API functions is that a user has, sits in front of the front end, so in front of the tool, and then clicks some buttons waiting for something to happen. Um, these button clicks are you, uh, basically are sent to the API, and the API translates it and puts it in such a way that our database can understand what is happening. The database, which is an SQL database, PostgreSQL, um, then delivers the data and sends it back to, oops, that's the wrong direction, sends it back to the API, which converts it to something that's understandable to the front end, and that's when things get mapped. So this is the whole process of an API in a nutshell. Uh, in other words, the API enables us to map the data directly from our database. So the source of our data is the database that our researchers use. We can do this kind of mapping based on different criteria of the informants and filter. Currently, what we're doing is we're mapping for the language production experiments, for token or for lemma, for the tags, for the manual annotations, and all of this can be filtered by the age, the gender, the education level, the job, and so on of the informant and the setting that this piece of language data was produced in. I bring here another example, maybe this is when uh, the sound works, where I do exactly that. I'm looking for a stimulus from a language production experiment here, house, so house, um, and this was a picture naming task. And here we see, okay, I can filter this and I only wanna see the young people, so below 40, this is kind of like the categorization that dial dialectologists work in, and then I get my data that I can listen to. Hoss? So here, for example, we have one, uh, uh, we have one sample, and here another one of someone Hoss. naming. It's Naming the houses in question. Um, why would you do this? What's the point behind this? We have a philosophy of two approaches, so to say. On the one hand, this works as a tool for data exploration, and on the other hand, this doubles as a very traditional linguistic atlas. Um, the first approach, the approach is that, that of data exploration, simply means that because we have so many filters, we have so many criterion, uh, criteria that we can apply, we can use this as a way to access all our data. So I could say, hey, I want to see all the data that was tagged with a vocalized L, so that's just a way of pronouncing L, um, from all the male speakers that we have that are younger than 60, and I want to see that on a map. And we can do this for many parameters and can compare them to each other. So this is more or less the approach of visualizing our research data without expecting a specific kind of result, so kind of like this explorative um, approach. I show this here, how this works, um, with exactly the example of the vocalized L. So I create a legend for my map where I add a parameter, in this case, vocalized Ls, and I tell the API, hey, give me people who are below 60, and give me only male speakers, please, and then I specify what I actually want to see. And in this case, we're using the manual annotation, and this has all the manual annotations that we use in the database built in as well. I just add this to the map. And uh, there's gonna be an audio example here again. This is the actual loading time. So I did not speed this up, we're very proud of this. Uh, this is how long it takes to get the results. Oh, I think I got an email in the background, sorry. And here. Yeah, sorry, I think sometimes the, the examples don't, don't work as well. But yeah, this is how this is done. That is one way how we can use this data, but that also means we can create actually very intricate maps, and this is where the double feature comes in, how we also use this as a very traditional linguistic atlas. These kind of parameters can be combined and actually create analytical maps. These can be commented on and then exported. That creates a stable URL which is saved in a database, and this actually allows us to have a lot of curated maps that can then be a linguistic atlas. I show this here, so this is 
a more elaborate map where I compare vocalized and non-vocalized L by speakers who are male and below 60. Um, and I, as you can see, we, crea uh, we create this little pie chart and we get a number and we see, okay, the vocalization is apparently more common in northeastern Austria. We can hear it again. This was a very short example. And I can just export this map, uh, give it a name, export it. This is sent back to our database via the API, and it's actually saved in the database. And that creates a short URL that I can share with friends or that I can use to quote something in the future, and this will always create the same map. Yeah, some of the benefits of our approach, we uh, have shown that the API can obviously be a useful tool to map our research data we have a one approach fits all, so we have one tool that does our data exploration and also the data presentation. And because we curate the entire database, uh, we kind of show how our research can be made reproducible because all the analysis can be reproduced here in this tool. Obviously, there's also some problems because it wants to do so much. There's a broad user base, linguists, but also kind of everyone who's interested that has consequences on the UI and UX design, uh, which we're working on and we're still working on uh, getting our data a bit more consistent, but we still have a little bit time because uh, it will be coming at the beginning of 2024 and then I hope I can you know, uh, see all of you in the Dieu Sprachatlas, probably under, under a different name though. But yeah, thank you very, very much for your attention.